Mind. Let's uh, begin with a quote from Richard Dawkins. He says, I am against religion because it teaches us to be satisfied with not understanding the world. Of course, uh, I would say in my case this is obviously false, and I know many other scientists who are Christians, even here in various universities here in southern Ontario, that would strenuously disagree with that because um, even though they do believe there is a God and that they are for example, Christians, they're still very much interested in pursuing science and understanding how the way the, how the world works. That's a perspective from an atheist, but on the other hand, many people of faith feel that science has been misused or even abused by atheists. It does lend an air of respectability to atheism. Science does. So if atheism can wrap itself in the cloak of uh, science, then of course it looks much more respectable. There's something about science that makes it easy to do that, and that is science seeks for natural explanations for everything. And that's an approach that atheism is committed to a priori. It's a non-negotiable with atheism. It is negotiable for science. Science, it, properly done, should recognize what effects are in its area of expertise and what aren't, but at the, at the moment there seems to be a, a movement or momentum towards this idea that science could explain everything. Consequently, science is being abused in an attempt to explain everything, and uh, we see that abuse in the form of creative storytelling, priority of verification over falsification, and those are just two examples and we can talk more about that in a, in a while. So is there a conflict between God and science? So let me rephrase that. Is there a conflict between religion and science? I would say there is a conflict between religion and science for two reasons. Number one, there can be false religious beliefs or unwarranted assumptions that people make even if they are very sincere. They make an unwarranted assumption that just might not be true. Therefore, it's going to sooner or later conflict with reality and with science. On the other hand, there are false scientific beliefs, and these are beliefs that might be supported by verification and creative storytelling, but they're false nonetheless, and they will conflict with reality eventually as well. For example, what I mean by verification is you can come up with an hypothesis or a theory, and you can actually find things and evidence to support that. For example, the old Ptolemaic system where everything revolved around the Earth. The Earth was the center of the universe. And they had developed some very complicated and complex uh, ways of predicting the orbits of planets and so forth. And they actually worked, but they were complex and complicated because, in fact, the universe does not revolve around the Earth. So that was an example of a false scientific belief at the time, or even a false belief. The scientists, a lot of them would say, well, that wasn't a scientific belief, but um, we have modern day equivalents that I can maybe address later on. So just by way of overview in this presentation, I want to first look at this misconception. I'm going to call it a misconception that is science advances religion retreats. In some ways it's true, but in other ways it's not true at all. And then I want to look at the God of the gaps argument, because I find that whenever I present an argument that has the conclusion that God exists or God might exist, people will immediately, many of them will say, oh, that must be a God of the gaps argument. They're not really familiar with what a God of the Gaps argument is. So I need to look at that briefly before I head into the main body of my presentation. At that point, number three, I want to look at the actual state of affairs. And I'm going to particularly look at that religion that seems to be taking the most attacks in the scientific world, and that is Christianity. I want to look at what the relationship is between Christianity and science. And then finally, um, on a more philosophical note, I want to look at the relationship as I see it, or in my own experience, between God and science. So I'm going to say that there's no conflict at all between God and science unless science believes false things. But there is conflict between religion and science, depending on the religion and what they believe. So let's begin with this first uh, idea here that we often hear, and that is, as science advances, religion retreats. One of my uh, favorite uh, science fiction writers when I was in high school was Arthur C. Clarke, and he said, science can destroy religion by ignoring it as well as by disproving its tenets. And uh, I think 
Uh, if you look at certain types of religion, I'm going to look at Greek mythology now, that could be true. So that to a certain degree it's true, but then I want to look at the basic Christian beliefs when it comes to God and nature and argue that that's not true at all. But let's look at Greek mythology first of all, because that's what is used in selling this idea that as science advances religion retreats. In pre-Socratic times, that is prior to the time of Socrates and Plato, everything was unexplained to the ancient Greeks. In their mind, the gods were behind everything, every tree, every rock, every lightning bolt, every storm. But as time went on, uh, we began to learn more and more about the world, and we had to appeal less and less to some of these Greek gods at the time of Socrates. By the end of the later part of the 20th century, uh, it looked like we needed no gods at all to explain things. The remaining gaps in our knowledge seemed to be relatively small. Now, we knew we hadn't explained everything, of course, but we seemed to be really making good headway on explaining a lot of things, and therefore, it appeared that there, were no, there was no need at all to appeal to the Greek gods, not that anybody thought about them anymore. But still, the underlying idea that many began to promote that is, well, as science advances, superstition and belief in these gods retreats, because science explains more and more that we used to attribute to the ancient gods. Science and Christianity have a very different track record than science and Greek or Roman mythology or other ancient uh, superstitious religions. Before I do that, though, I want to uh, look briefly at the God of the Gaps argument. The primary premise in a God of the Gaps argument goes like this. If we do not know what caused X, then God did it. And if you see that kind of a premise embedded in an argument, you could probably safely assume you're looking at a God of the Gaps argument. Here's an example. If we don't know what caused X, then God did it. Proposition number two. We don't know what caused the origin of life, therefore God did it. That would be an example of a God of the Gaps argument. It's simply premised on whatever we don't know, uh, must, God must have done it. And of course you can see that there's some problems here. Obviously it does not follow that because we do not know what caused X, that therefore God did it. Uh, there are a lot of things we don't know, and there's even more we didn't know in the past, and over time we finally, we slowly learn more about the way the world works, and we find that there are natural explanations for many of the things that we didn't understand in the past. On the other hand, though, and this is where the atheist often makes a mistake here, on the other hand, it does not follow that God did not do it. And that's an important point to remember. Furthermore, it does not follow that the alternative explanation is the correct one, especially if the other option is falsified. Maybe some argument is given and uh, they will say, well, that's a God of the Gaps argument, and by saying that, they assume that they have successfully defended the other notion, which is there must be a natural process out there that does this. When in fact, uh, all we can conclude, the only thing we can conclude, is that we don't know what caused whatever it is we're discussing. So it doesn't automatically follow that because we don't know what did it, that therefore God did it, but neither does it follow that the other option is the correct one either. We simply don't know. So consider the following God of the Gaps argument that I presented earlier. We don't know what caused the origin of life. If we don't know what caused any X, then God did it. Therefore, God did it, the origin of life in this case. Now, many atheists rightly point out the weakness of this kind of an argument, but then mistakenly assume that they have defended the idea that natural processes did it. In reality, the God of the Gaps argument tells us nothing other than we don't know what caused X, okay? But the main thing to remember before I move into the next argument is that uh, not all arguments that conclude that God exists are automatically God of the Gaps argument, contrary to popular assumption. What you have to look for is a premise embedded in that argument that goes something like, if we don't know what caused X, then God did it. It's basically an argument from ignorance and just assuming that God did it if we're ignorant of what the cause was. Uh, what I'm going to present now are not God of the Gaps arguments. They're not arguments from what we do not know, but from what we do know. Uh, very important to underscore that. 
So let's look at now at the actual state of affairs, and what I want to look at is not the state of affairs between Greek mythology and science. I think that's pretty much a done deal. Uh, well, I want to look at the state of affairs between uh, Christianity, biblical Christianity and science. I want to look just at the, the very central core beliefs in Christianity when it comes to God's involvement in nature. And the first one, that God is responsible for the origin of nature, and there's two aspects to that. First of all, the origin of the cosmos themselves, or itself. In the beginning, it says, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. Now, there's no uh, statement whatsoever about when this beginning was. Uh, we could make assumptions about that, but as I said before, be careful about making your assumptions, because if they are assumptions without just reading into or assuming things, you could wind up in trouble. But in, it simply states that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was out form. It wasn't even a planet at this stage in Genesis chapter 1. It had no form. So that's one of the things that uh, biblical Christianity clearly credits God with, is that God was the creator of the cosmos. But there's something else that is absolutely astounding for an ancient text, and that is God is credited with the origin of the laws of physics or the laws of nature that govern the universe. And here's a quote from the book of Job, which is thought by theologians to be um, probably the oldest book in the Old Testament, the oldest book in the Bible, perhaps the oldest book known to humanity. We don't know for sure exactly when it was written, but certain things within the text seem to indicate a very early origin. And in this, this book, there's a conversation, a dialogue going on between God and Job. And God, God wants to point out to Job just how little he actually knows about things. And therefore, it follows from that that he's not really in a position to know what God should and should not permit in this world. But one of the things God asks Job, he says, Do you know the ordinances of the heavens or the laws of the heavens or fix their rule over the earth? So what God is saying here is that he is the one responsible for the laws of nature that govern the cosmos, and these are the same laws that also govern the earth. And there's almost an implication here that uh, against geocentrism, that is, the earth is not central. The earth is subject, is part of the cosmos, and the, which is a much larger thing. And over all of this are laws of nature that control how nature works, how the world works, how the cosmos work, and as well as what goes on here on earth. There are laws of nature. What's astounding about that is that this is an ancient text. This is completely without precedent in any text that old. If there are, in, in the oldest ones that we can get our hands on, that we still have remaining to us today. The other major claim that biblical Christianity makes is that God is responsible for the origin of life in its major kinds. For example, it says, Then God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind. Now, there's no expansion on how the earth was to bring forth these living creatures, and that leaves a, a lot of room for interpretations, and a lot of people go off on a lot of different directions on this. But one of the things that is difficult to avoid, one of the things that I think a, a biblical Christian has to um, grant is that God is being credited with the origin of life in its major taxonomic groups. It's not just a, a simple life form that expands into many different life forms, but there are major taxonomic groups and God is credited with the origin of life in these major taxonomic groups, whatever they are. And it doesn't even explain whether it's what, what level of taxonomy we're talking about here, it just is after their kind. So those are the two claims the two major claims that Christianity makes with regard to God and science and the Bible and so forth. What I want to look now is to look at those two major claims and see has science pushed back at all in those two areas. We know they've pushed, certainly science has certainly pushed back on the uh, Greek myth mythological view of the world, but ha what has it done when it regards, with regards to these two major claims of biblical Christianity? There was an article published just over a year ago in New Scientist, and the article uh, summarized the consensus of opinions amongst various cosmologists to the effect that uh, there is a beginning to the universe. And they looked at various theories, uh, the Big Bang Theory, the oscillating universe theory that ultimately expands and then collapses, then expands again, 
and the multiverse theory. And there's several different versions of the multiverse theory where there's a large number of universes out there spawning other universes and so forth. But in every case, it seems that the consensus of opinion amongst cosmologists, which are those scientists who focus on the uh, origin of the universe, that's their area, that they focus on the origin of the universe, the consensus of opinion is that there has to be a beginning regardless. Stephen Hawking, who has, uh, I think, leaned in the direction of atheism, expresses his worry about this. He says, a point in that same article, and this is the quote in its entirety, uh, I find that often when I quote uh, somebody, the, the people, the critics might say, well, he took it out of context or whatever. That's what the reference here is for. I, you can, I'll email you the paper if you want. But this in quote in its entirety expresses his worry, and that is, a point of creation would be a place where science broke down. One would have to appeal to religion and the hand of God. So, the question is, is Hawking right? Does it mean that if there's an origin for the universe, if the universe has a beginning, does it mean that we have to appeal to the hand of God? Well, I want to look at that a little closer. And uh, one of the things that we need to be clear about is what a circular fallacy is. A circular fallacy occurs when you assume the conclusion that you want to prove, you assume that's true in your opening premise, and then you reason from that to prove the conclusion but you already pr assumed it true in your opening premise. That's a circular fallacy. You can have a circular statement, for example, uh, the Bible is true because it says it's true. So you can see there's a circularity there. You can only assume that it's true because it says it's true if you already assume that it's true, so, the, so that when it says that it's true, you know that it's true, and, and obviously there's a problem. But this has implications when trying to come up with a natural explanation for the origin of natural explanations. Or it has, expo it has implications when we look at what natural processes can we invoke to explain how natural processes came into existence. You see, the problem is, at the origin of the universe, there, are no, there is no nature, there are no natural processes. The problem is, what caused nature? What caused natural processes to come into existence? So in other words, if we have no nature, we have to come up, we have to go from a state of no nature as our antecedent condition, and then move into a state of we got nature as the consequent, and what is that antecedent, what, what, what was it that brought about the origin of nature itself? It cannot be a scientific explanation, mind you, because if you have no nature, you have no science. Science is founded on natural processes. It seeks to find natural explanations for things that go on in nature, but we're not talking about things that go on in nature here. We're talking about where nature comes from in the first place, and I'm defining nature as the entire cosmos. And if you want to invoke a multiverse, one of the multiverse theories, then I'm defining nature as the entire multiverse system. All of these systems um, require space, time, matter, and energy. Of, for example, Hawking and Melodno's uh, ultimate M theory system is uh, composed of 11 dimensions, one time dimension, and 10 space dimensions. All of them require space time. Now there's an implication for the origin of space-time as well. Let's assume that time was caused by omega. To avoid the circular fallacy, omega itself must be timeless. Now to clarify, if you want to explain what brought about the origin of time, you can obviously omega cannot depend on time, because then you would have a circular problem again. You have something depending on time that is response that it has to bring time into existence, but since time doesn't exist, neither will it if it's dependent on time and you never get anywhere. So whatever it was that brought time, whatever the cause of physical time is, it has to be timeless. Therefore, omega cannot have been caused by something, as that would require, to say, for example, to say, well, well then what caused omega? But the moment you ask that question, you're assuming there was a time when omega did not exist, something caused it, and now it exists. In other words, omega has a temporal beginning, and you smuggled time back into that realm. But what, one thing we know, and, and it's logically necessary, that time, that omega has to be timeless if it's going to be responsible for the origin of time. It's going to cause the time to come into existence. So, uh, uh, just to clarify what I'm talking about in this next section, I'm going to talk about nature 
the nat nat things that are natural and things that are supernatural are two categories. The category of the natural, the category of the supernatural. The natural category would include anything that's bounded by space-time, matter and energy, and the laws of physics. The supernatural I'm defining as something, the, the set of all things that are not natural, that is, not bounded by space-time, matter and energy, and the laws of physics. So we have two categories, the natural category and the supernatural category. And there is no other option available to us. It's either natural or it's not natural. Those are the two categories. Each category, however, may include many different things. For example, the natural category would be uh, my laptop computer, uh, this lectern, uh, the planet. Uh, all these things would fall into a category, a set of things. Uh, the supernatural category might include many things as well. Things that don't seem to be bounded by space, time, matter, and energy, the laws of physics. And obviously, God, if God exists, God would be in that second, that second category as well. So here's what logic demands. The ultimate cause of nature must be either natural or not natural. Now note, this is not a gaps argument here. It's not, uh, we don't know what did it, therefore God did it. We know that whatever it was responsible for the origin of the universe has to be in one of these two categories. These are the only two categories there are. Second proposition, the cause of nature cannot be natural. That would be a circular fallacy. In other words, it's logically impossible for nature to be the cause of nature, or for natural processes to bring into existence natural processes, because we would have to assume the existence of natural processes already in order to explain how they're going to bring natural processes into existence. That is a circular fallacy. Therefore, the cause of nature must be the second category, the supernatural category. It's logically checkmate. There is no other option, and there's no other escape from this particular argument. Number four, the cause of time must be able to exist independent of time in order to create time, as we saw already, to avoid the circular fallacy. Therefore, the cause of time itself cannot have a cause, as I explained earlier. There's no temporal beginning in front of which to put a cause. Therefore, the cause of nature must be supernatural, timeless, uncaused, and eternal. Where did all this come from? talking about the entire universe, or multi-universe, their ultimate M-theory system if there is one. Whatever it is, let's just call it nature. So where did nature come from? Some people believe that science can provide a natural explanation for everything. But is there a natural explanation for the origin of nature itself? Stephen Hawking claims that our universe could come out of nothing. But it doesn't really mean nothing at all. He still admits that he needs some sort of ultimate 11 dimensional M3 system with its own fundamental laws of physics in order to produce our universe. But that hardly solves the problem, does it? Where did that M3 system come from? A recent article in the journal New Scientist states that the consensus among physicists is that a creation event for the universe cannot be avoided. Nature had a beginning. It's kind of like there's a starting gun to the universe. So when it comes to the beginning of the universe, what pulled the trigger? There's a logical mistake called the circular fallacy. It occurs when you assume your conclusion in your opening premise and work from that premise to prove your conclusion. That is a circular argument and the logical fallacy. The person who believes that there is a natural explanation for the origin of nature makes the same mistake. You cannot assume the existence of natural processes in order to explain how natural processes came into existence. It is logically impossible to have a natural explanation for the origin of nature because of the circular fallacy. So logic dictates that the origin of nature must be something not natural. Perhaps that is why Stephen Hawking is quoted in that same New Science article as saying, a point of creation would be a place where science broke down. One would have to appeal to religion and the hand of God. I know what you're thinking. What caused God? But there is an answer to that too. What caused time? Time seems to be a physical property of nature. We can't assume the existence of something dependent upon time 
in order to explain the origin of time. That would be another circular fallacy. So logic dictates that God must be able to exist independent of time, in order to bring time into existence. So when you ask, what caused God? You are assuming there was a time when God did not exist, something caused God, and now he does exist. But logic requires that God, if he is to create time, must be a timeless being. No cause is possible. So to summarize, the cause of nature must be either natural or supernatural. But it cannot be natural, that would be a circular fallacy. Therefore, the cause of nature must have a supernatural origin. The cause of time must be timeless. It is impossible for any timeless entity to have been caused by something. Therefore, the cause of nature must be timeless, supernatural, and uncaused. Well, this next piece of evidence right here seems to indicate that there is an intent behind the origin of the universe such that it's capable of supporting life. Uh, Roger Penrose, who's a colleague of uh, Stephen Hawking, has crunched some numbers and um, probability of getting any kind of universe at all capable of supporting life is approximately one chance in 10 raised to the 10 raised to the 123rd power. So this seems to suggest that the universe has actually been intentionally designed to be able to support life. And if that's the case, then we not only have an uncaused, supernatural, timeless creator, but it seems to point to this creator it has a mind, that there's a mind or intent behind this. So in conclusion, with regard to nature and the hand of God, logic and mathematics are prerequisites for science. Logic dictates that it's logically impossible to have a natural explanation or a scientific explanation for the origin of natural explanations, or in other words, the origin of nature. Logic brings us, I would say, to checkmate on the supernatural. That is, it exists, there doesn't seem to be any way out of it. It is the foundation and the cause of space-time, matter and energy, and the laws of physics which control these things. Now, I want to look next at the question, has science pushed back on the origin of life? Science, as we see, has not pushed back at all, has, not, has nothing to say and never will have anything to say on the origin of nature and the laws of physics, not ultimately. And that's what we've just seen from logic, but has science pushed back in the area of biological life, the origin of life? What you see here is a molecular machine that slowly ratchets the DNA into the protein capsule of certain viruses one helical turn at a time. And when we look at these molecular machines, it seems to suggest that there's a designer behind the origin of life and behind these little molecular machines. Has science explained the origin of life? <clears throat> In 2004, this paper was published, Chance and Necessity Do Not Explain the Origin of Life. And the summary sentence at the end of the abstract explains why. It states, all known metabolism is cybernetic. That is, it's programmatically and algorithmically organized and controlled. In other words, it appears that the information encoded in the geno genomes of life, it looks like software to us. And that was in 2004. 2007, evolutionary biologist Eugene Koonin publishes a paper in Biology Direct, uh, basically uh, arguing that the probability of getting RNA replication is so small, we could never expect to see it occur anywhere in this entire universe. His solution is there must be an infinite number of universes. And uh, that, I think, is science's god of the gaps. Um, I see it in two areas. The first area is the universe appears incredibly fine-tuned to support life, so fine-tuned that there must be an intelligent mind behind it, but many scientists would say, well, no, not really. Uh, maybe, in fact, it's that they actually, actually argue that that's evidence that there must be an infinite number of universes. Otherwise, we'd never get one like this where we can, where we can have life. Again, a God of the gaps argument, appealing to an infinite number of unseen, untestable entities uh, to try and explain an effect that uh, they have no clue what produced it. Same with this, same with biological life, appealing to an infinite number of universes. Since then, there's another book out where he argues this more strenuously and more rigorously. 2011, Scientific American, revealing or laying out 
the state of affairs when it comes to the origin of life and admitting that we don't have a clue how life began. 2012, the following year, answers the question why this might be the case. Why is it that science has failed thus far to find a natural explanation for the origin of life? Craig Venter states that all living cells that we know of on this planet are DNA software driven biological machines comprised of hundreds of thousands of protein robots coded for by the DNA that carry out precise functions. As far as I know, none of these scientists that I'm quoting here are, would say that God did it. Uh, all they're pointing out here is that A, we don't have a clue how life began, and B, uh, it looks like maybe we might have a problem coming up with a natural explanation, and that is it appears that the information encoded in the genomes of life is software, very sophisticated software, and normally uh, there's only one thing we know of that creates software, and that's the next paper. This paper has just come out. This is the first paper in a scientific journal arguing that the origin of life has to have an intelligent origin. It says here we show that the terrestrial code, referring to the genetic code, displays a thorough precision type orderliness matching the criteria to be considered an information signal, informational signal. Simple arrangements of the code reveal an ensemble of arithmetical and ideographical patterns of the same symbolic language. Accurate and systematic, these underlying patterns appear as a product of precision logic and non-trivial computing rather than of stochastic processes or random processes. And, and then to clarify, they state, and I've highlighted in yellow, the null hypothesis that they are due to chance coupled with presumable evolutionary pathways is rejected with a p-value less than 10 to the minus 13. Now normally if you get a p-value less than 0 0.05 or certainly less than 0 0.01, the null hypothesis is rejected. Here it's rejected on far, far more impressive, uh, impressively small p-value. Then in pink, the patterns, it's not just rejecting evolutionary and random processes here, but in pink, the patterns display readily recognizable hallmarks of artificiality, among which are the symbol of zero, the privileged decimal syntax, and semantical symmetries. Besides, extraction of the signal involves logically straightforward but abstract operations, making the patterns essentially irreducible to natural origin. What they're saying here is that a genetic code cannot have a natural origin, and it can be rejected statistically with a p-value less than 10 to the minus 13. Why is this? Another paper in 2005, looking at the software encoded in our genome, said this. Without volitional agency, Assigning meaning to each configurable switch position symbol, algorithmic function and language will not occur. And what they point out in that paper is that the information encoded in the genomes of life is found in only two other places, human languages and computer software. And they're arguing here that the information uh, found, in fact, they're looking at biopolymeric information, for example, DNA, RNA, and proteins. They're looking at that, the information encoded in there has to have does require volitional agency, that is rational agency, to write the program, to set the, the configuration of the various um, options at each step in the sequence. So that leads us, that paper there leads us to an hypothesis, and that is this. A unique property of intelligence is the ability to produce statistically significant levels of functional information. And the key word there is unique. What this does is it provides us with a marker or a fingerprint of intelligence. It gives us a positive way to test whether or not the origin of life required an intelligent origin or not, or whether natural processes will do the job. Now we know that we can produce, that intelligence can produce statistically significant levels of functional information. You do that every time you send a text, write an email, write an essay, and so forth. It's not a, we don't know what could do this, therefore God did it, not at all. It is, we know what can do this, it's intelligence. The question is whether anything else can do that. And uh, so far, and there's, it's, it's testable, this hypothesis is testable and falsifiable, and so far it looks like it's not been falsified, that it is continually verified time and time again and has enormous explanatory power, by the way. So here's the argument. A unique property of intelligence is the ability to produce statistically significant levels of functional information. 
X requires or carries a statistically significant level of functional information, therefore X required intelligence to produce, and you can plug in whatever you want for X, if that is the case. Note that this is the opposite of a God of the Gaps argument. It's not, we don't know what can do this, it is based on what we do know can do it. Ribosomal S7 is a universal protein found in all biological life. What I did here is I downloaded 3,751 sequences from PFAM database, and then I stripped out the redundant ones and found that there were just over 2,100 unique sequences for ribosomal S7. And that allowed me to calculate the amount of information required to code for, a, for any ribosomal S7 protein domain. And uh, using the uh, method that I've published there in that paper at the bottom of the slide. What I found is that it required 332 bits of functional information. That is impressively statistically significant. Therefore, we can conclude that ribosomal S7 has the fingerprints of intelligence all over it, of an intelligent origin. We have very strong, positive fingerprint of an intelligent source. The probability of natural processes coming up uh, with any sequence at all that will code for ribosomal S7 is approximately 10 to the minus 100th power. That won't happen in the, anywhere in the universe during the course of, say, 13.5 billion years. It will not happen. I want to conclude now with uh, looking briefly at the relationship between God and science. I'm going to give you my perspective both as a scientist and as a philosopher, so you're getting my personal perspective here. And the way I see it, God has created nature, that is, the cosmos, space-time, matter and energy, and the laws of physics that govern them. And uh, that's what makes science possible. Science, I would say, is our tool to figure out how nature works. So just because I believe that God exists and is the creator of the cosmos, it doesn't stop me from being a scientist. I, we still are curious to figure out how does nature work. There's a verse in the Bible that says, Great are the works of the Lord. They are studied by all who delight in them. So I would, I would infer from this that God actually approves of, of science. He actually proves us of people who will study nature to try and understand how nature works. It's a good thing, in other words. What I'm suggesting is that God and science are mutually enriching. How so? When I see a painting, a beautiful painting, I can enjoy that painting, but if I personally know the artist, my enjoyment of that painting takes on a whole new level because I know the artist and I can see how the artist's personality and so forth comes out in the painting. And I can, I can learn more about the artist itself. The painting sometimes is a window into the soul of the artist. What is the purpose of life? If the entire cosmos have been designed for the purpose of supporting life, it suggests that life itself has a purpose. And we can infer from that that we ourselves have a purpose. And it's not a purpose that we invent, but it's a purpose that comes ultimately from the divine creator of the universe. So that's my first point here, is that the universe appears to have been designed to support life, and therefore there must be a purpose for life. Could it be that we've actually been designed as individuals such that we are incomplete without God? What I've noticed, and a lot of other people have noticed, is that there are certain deep fundamental cravings that humans seem to have all over the world and throughout history. For example, one is the craving for significance. That is to feel um, that you're not just a bag of meat, uh, worth only what you imagine you're worth, or worth only what other people value you for. You're not just that. There, you actually do have a value that is independent of how rich you are, how athletic you are, uh, how good-looking you are, how intelligent or lack thereof you are, that somehow you have a value and it's independent of all of those physical things. There's this intuition that, that this really, we, we really crave that. And we want to be valued not just for 10 minutes or for part of our life, we want to be valued for all of our life and in fact it would be nice if we could be valued forever, although many people would think that's unreasonable. Another fundamental human craving we seem to have is the craving for identity, that is, we want to we want to be known and remembered, not just for a few minutes, 
but we erect monuments, we erect monuments over our graves that say something to, so that to somehow not be forgotten. And the longer you can be remembered, somehow people feel better about that. There seems to be this craving, even perhaps to be remembered forever, although of course many people feel that's unreasonable. But what if it isn't? What if the universe has been created by God for the purpose of supporting life, and particularly you have a purpose as well, and that purpose, because of these deep fundamental cravings, no human can fulfill those, but God could. What if there is a being who's not only the origin of the cosmos, but the origin of beauty, of justice, of love, of honor, of um, music, and art, and every good thing given, and every perfect gift? That's one of the explanations of God given in the Bible. What if such a being exists, and what if such a being is eternal, such that God could know and remember you forever, and value you forever, and what if you could actually live forever? Now there is a problem, of course. Um, if, if God is the origin of absolute justice, flawless justice, and also the origin of love and honor, then there's a problem because we've all violated that standard of justice. And that's a problem for God because then perfect justice must be carried out for all of us who've fallen short of God's standard of flawless justice and perfect beauty and so forth and absolute purity. But on the other hand, flawless love must also be carried out. So how could that happen? And this is where this idea in biblical Christianity emerges as having special significance. And that is the idea that God actually became a human being at one point in history to satisfy the demands of perfect justice so that he could then satisfy the demands of perfect love if you are willing to accept that. And his name was Jesus of Nazareth. So that's a central idea of, of biblical Christianity or what I would call authentic Christianity. When I say authentic Christianity, I want to distinguish between uh, religion of Christianity, which has all sorts of extra beliefs and traditions built up around it over the centuries, not to mention the behavior of various people who would claim to follow that religion, and people tend to think that's all part of Christianity, but it's not part of at all what Jesus taught. So when you see some, say, Christian on TV or person who professes to be a Christian and then find out that, as I did the other day, that this person has been guilty of a criminal offense against a minor. Uh, that, ask yourself, is this what Jesus taught? Of course not. So that's what I do. I want to distinguish between authentic Christianity and that. God loves us to study His creation. He encourages us to do that. Science is our tool to study creation, but there is a purpose for life. There is something much deeper. And a person of science should not just focus on only those things that are the natural, but perhaps consider the possibility, given that we can't avoid it anyways, that there is a supernatural ultimate reality which gives substance to the physical world. If that's the case, then consider the implications, and especially the implications of God has ever stepped into history as a human being. So my final quote here, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life, he who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Very interesting statement, kind of complex, but if you study more of what he says, it begins to make sense that there are different kinds of death. There's a spiritual death, there's a physical death. There's spiritual life, there's physical life. And to have this deep spiritual life that he suggests we can have, to have eternal life and a relationship with God who is the origin of beauty, and nature, and purity, and music, and art, and love, and honor, and every good thing given and every perfect gift, to have a relationship with such a being, to plug into such a being, and have our ultimate craving satisfied, is offered to us as a gift, but the final step is up to each individual, whether, they not, whether or not they want to accept that gift, and what Jesus Christ did when He came the first time.